welcome to another episode of the Rediscovery Channel, where each week, myself, Stilber, and my buddy, Ivor, we tell each other a story from history that the other person may or may not have heard of. And this way, we kind of rediscover history together. And Ivor, um, this week, I want to talk to you about somebody called Guillaume Le Maréchal. You ever heard of him? No, but I'm guessing he's French. <laughs> Yeah, sort of, I guess. Um, it was a little bit different at the time. Um, his English name was William Marshall. Hmm. Does that ring a bell? It sounds familiar, but I must confess ignorance. Okay, so uh, this is the story of the, yeah, one of the original knights. Um, and, and some called him the greatest knight of all time, actually. Um, so uh, it's the story of uh, the fourth son of a minor 12th century baron, and he became one of the richest men of his day, regent of England, and governing the country on behalf of the boy king, Henry III. Huh. Um, and his life story is chronicled in the, the histoire, histoire de Guillaume le Maréchal. Um, which is the only known written biography of a non-royal to survive from the Middle Ages. Uh, and the poem, it's actually quite a large poem, uh, was composed after his death by an unknown author called John. Um, and it talks about all uh, yeah, the wonderful things William has done. And among other things, he he's described as the best knight in the world. Um, yeah. And this poem was was rediscovered um, in the 19th century, um, and it offers a unique window into the courtly life of the time. Um, so William, he was actually born around 1146 as a younger son of a minor noble. Um, so he would have known from an early age on that um, he would basically be poor. <laughs> Um, so um, he would have to make his own way in life. Uh, so either that meant you would either go into the church um, or you would offer up your uh, fealty to, to a lord um, with, with goods, with money. So when he was about 12, William was packed off to his mother's cousin, William de Tonkerville in Normandy in France to begin his training as a knight. So that was to be his profession. Uh, and it was there, <clears throat> there that uh, William would have learned to use the tools of his chosen profession, which included um, mastering the latest shock tactic of the day, which was riding into battle on a horse whilst carrying a, a carefully aimed war lance. Um, and William trained for seven years to perfect this knightly skill as well as refining his prowess with the sword and mace. Um, so it wasn't just all training and practice. Uh, he was, he actually got the nickname also called Greedy Guts during his early years at the Tankerville Retinue. Greedy Guts? Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah, and this has to do with, um, with also how he became so successful, actually, and, and well known. Um, it was in the final year of his apprenticeship that the now six foot tall William learned that his father had died and as expected had left him with no money at all. So he realized that he better start earning his living. Uh, and as a knight fighting in tournaments appeared to be the, the best way to make money. So that was actually a way um, at the time that you had all these knights that were loyal to their, to their lords. Um, you know, these knights that had by themselves, no money, and the way for them to make money was to, to basically work as a soldier, you know, as paid soldiers for, for kings that did have lands and, and goods. And then in return, they would get their own little piece of land and, and take care of it and, and things like that. But, you know, in peaceful times, if there was no, no fighting to be done, uh, you have to keep these people occupied because otherwise they may go out and start raiding places and, and create all kinds of issues, which, you know, happened quite a lot, actually. And the way that was done in medieval Europe, this was uh, by holding tournaments. 
So these were actually mock battles in which uh, knights would showcase their sh skills and talents. Um, and typically hundreds, sometimes thousands of mounted knights uh, carrying war lances and other equipment would charge headlong into each other. Uh, and in the melee that followed, swords and maces were used to knock seven bells out of each other. And this was a training method for war. And even though the uh, purpose of these fights was not to kill each other, um, it wasn't uncommon for people to die, um, get crushed by, by their horses, people would get their teeth shattered, bones were broken, etc. So it was pretty hardcore. Yeah, I've heard about that. Uh, and there is also a saying um, I read in this book called The Age of Chivalry. There was uh, supposedly a saying that, like, um, you weren't ready to go to the Crusades if you still had all your teeth and uh, <laughs> you didn't have, like, something broken at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, la later on, they would actually um, change it a little bit where it was mostly just the jousting, you know, from the Renaissance Festival, where it was just one versus one. Yeah, that stuff uh, is so contrived. Th that Yes, but in the early days, it was really just um, battle lines of horses in trying to outmaneuver each other. And then the word tournament actually comes from the French tournée because they would ride at each other and then turn around uh, to turn, tourn, uh, which is French for turning, um, and then go at each other with like hammers and swords, etc. So, you ever stop to wonder like what the horses are thinking about all this? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. They've been They've been used in like war for so long and you know they just want to eat, eat their oats and mate but they have no idea with probably no idea at all what's going on but they're just like, like going along with it. Yeah that's a good good, uh, good question. <laughs> Somebody's probably gonna <laughs> knock that in the comments like why are you talking this? <laughs> yeah. you know? If only we could ask them yeah. yeah. You can't ask the horse. No no. What do you think horse? Yeah, Mr. Ed. Oh, I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, so for William, um, there was actually um, um, a tournament not too far away um, in the fields of Picardy, northern France. And that's where Europe's uh, warrior elite would meet on a regular basis to compete in tournaments. Uh, and knights would arrive from all corners of Europe, including Spain, England, Scotland, France. Belgium and other places, forming Russia? teams. Ah, good question. Good question. I don't know. Maybe I can uh, find out and put it in the comments. It's yes. it's good, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, they actually had very few rules. Uh, and in real war, the prize was whatever ransom could be extracted from the other captured knights, princes, and nobles. So William actually became, uh, by the 1170s, he became somewhat of a superstar uh, and he had grown very rich simply by taking, um, taking these uh, noblemen, uh, capturing these noblemen and knights and, and keeping them for ransom. And typically, like, he, you know, like he would basically grab them, like outmaneuver them um and take somebody like he would take them by the stirrups for example he had a move a specific like football move you could maybe say and like be able to take a nobleman with him and then get this ransom money which was oftentimes was like jewelry gold or horses um and through these means and through his pure skill and cunning he he went from being a very poor a nobleman with nothing to one of the richest, well, very rich men. Um, so yeah, so his favorite move was to, to grab the opponent's horse and drag him from the tournament field. Um, another favorite tactic uh, <coughs> was uh, to hold his team back from the melee until everybody else was exhausted and then picking out the richest prize before riding into the field and capturing them. Um, and then in 1170, because of his, uh, his skill and his fame, he was appointed to the household of Henry, the young king. He was crowned king at the age of 15. 
Um, he effectively became player manager of the Young Kings Anglo-Norman tournament team. And for the next 12 years, uh, they fought alongside each other, aided by a team of up to 500 other knights, winning tournament after tournament. It was William's job uh, not only to devise team tactics, but also to act as a minder to the young king, usually the most valuable prize on the tournament field. So in, in 1182, William and Henry uh, fell out and um, they had a fight and William left the young king's tournament team to join the rival team of Philip of Flanders, uh, a move that apparently involved a huge transfer fee which is something you hear about in sports nowadays as well. Um, so, yeah. So then, um, 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 so the fallout didn't last long. So William was actually back at Henry's side when he died of dysentery on the 11th of June. Dysentery? Yeah, dysentery, sorry. Mm. Interesting. So 1183, he died. And then uh, with the approval of the bereaved King Henry II, he, uh, William set off to complete the crusade his dad master had vowed to make. So he carried young Henry's cross with him to Jerusalem. And then he spent two years in the Holy Land fighting with King Guy or Guy of Jerusalem and the Knights Templar. And then he returned to England in the year 1185 and he swore allegiance to King Henry uh, II and served as his loyal captain against his rebellious son, and heir Richard, soon to be Richard I, the Lionheart. Yeah. In return, the king gifted William the large royal estate of Cartmel in Cumbria. Um, Cumbria, I think that's actually, is that not in Northern Italy? Hmm. Hold on, Cumbria? Yeah. Let's see, it looks like it's in uh, England. It okay. is, yeah, 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 All okay, right. I must, yeah. So during a skirmish in uh, northern France in 1189, uh, William came face to face with the undutiful Richard and promptly unhorsed him. And then rather than putting the prince to the sword, he chose to make it, uh, his point by killing his horse instead. Which is yeah. pretty interesting. Yeah. That's why I'd be thinking like, uh, you know, what is the horse thinking of all this? If they're, they must not have been thinking they're going to die when they go into these battles. <laughs> I don't yeah. know, I they probably resist. Yeah, I wonder what the level of intelligence is. I think it's probably similar to like a dog or. Yeah, you know, I think so as well. Um, the horse is an animal you can form a personal relationship with and they can understand some words, but they're not going to understand all the complexities, you know? Yeah, and dogs will also go into battle and die. And not yeah. really think about it yeah, some think. people do as well actually so knows what they really think about though anyways right because we can't really get inside their heads and they can't really tell us much yeah not until we invite brain chips and then uh we can yeah. I, don't, I don't think we want to go that way you know that's gonna open up a whole nother i think it, i think it will come true though anyways and that's how yeah, you get the dino riders. Uh. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so um, uh, then Henry II died and uh, Richard, the Lionheart, became king. And even though they had fought only days before, uh, Richard rewarded William by giving him the hand of Isabel de Clare, heiress to the estates of Strongbow of England, mm. um, in, in England, Ireland, Normandy and Wales. Uh, and at the age of 43, uh, Million married his 17-year-old bride, transforming the landless knight from a minor family into a great baron and one of the richest men in the kingdom. And then in 1190, William was appointed to the Council of Regency, which was left to govern the country when the Lionheart departed to the Holy Land at the head of the Third Crusade. He acted as the king's hands-on general in his continuing wars in France against King Philip II. Um, and apparently he, he didn't really age like normal people, like even in 1197, uh, he was 50 years old. He sc still uh, scaled the walls of a besieged French castle castle and held it until reinforcements arrived. Hmm. Um, when challenged by the warden of the castle, he felled him with a single blow. 
His physical <laughs> fitness had helped him outlive three kings, and when King John uh, died in 1216, William was made regent of England and protector of the nine-year-old Henry III. So, something to be said for working out. Yeah. Yeah, and something to, to be said about like loyalty. So this guy lived through all these kings, and then he, from nowhere, and now he's the regent of England, protector of the nine-year-old Henry III, the king. Um, now, when he was 70 years old, uh, he had just one more fight left in him. And at the Battle of Lincoln in 1217, he led the king's army against an invading French force backed by rebel English barons. Uh, in true martial style, William led the charge, making sure that he was the first into town in order to capture the nobles and set their ransom demands. So, yeah, pretty much his uh, old tournament trick. So when he finally, uh, his, hel his hell finally filled him in 1219. And then on his deathbed, he was uh, invested in the Order of the Knights Templar, which is something he had promised he would do. And that's how it was made, uh, stuck to his promise. Um, and he apparently captured more than 500 knights in his career. Um, and uh, he's, his last wor words, uh, are uh, said to be, quote, I cannot defend myself from death. <laughs> it's pretty cool. And yeah. I really can't. But I think, um, you know, back then, uh, the, the medicine was not very good. And the doctors were, you know, there's a very good chance that the doctor may kill you with their crude treatments and their bumbling. They didn't really know about uh, DNA. They didn't really know about uh, viruses or bacteria. They thought disease spread by bad smells, you know. And um, wish there's something to be said about that. Yeah, because some things come, some things are airborne. Some but, things are airborne. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dysentery. I don't think he would have died of that today. I'm sure they would have, for whatever he had, they probably would have given him an antibiotic and he would have been okay. He might have lived to be like a hundred years old today but um like dysentery will dehydrate you and you know it's, it's like uh sometimes when you get those things you don't even uh like without i mean i'm not going to all the detail but you don't maybe always feel like even drinking water if everything upsets your stomach and like i'll just wait it out i'll pass it out and then you you die of dehydration from the disease yeah, yeah. Because it liquefies and you, anyways. Yeah, it's uh. Well, anyway, I thought it was a cool story, and I know you love Renaissance fairs. <laughs> Not anymore, man. I used to. You know, it's so it's so fake and contrived now. But yeah, I, I, but it's like still a, it's still fun, and and actually, like some of the the moral of the story here is that like even in those days they were kind of coming up with this code on, on how to be a knight um as it because there were no knights before like even the whole like creation of knights were, were was just something that was a reaction to to i think uh, the military threats of the, uh, the muslims and yeah and then but also the huns for example so they they had to learn how to to they had to have these really expensive um you know soldiers in place to to defend themselves because it was really expensive to have these knights and then once you had them you have to make sure they they were kept entertained and they also created this whole culture around like loyalty and um what it means to be a true knight and all the uh the valors that you what do you the valors right is that the word in english like the yeah, yeah. yeah yeah exactly like yeah, valor all... is like it's courage yeah okay so that's crazy yeah so but you had all these these rule virtues that you had to abide to as a knight and and the, the legend of king arthur uh, and the and the round table played a, a huge part in that as well that was actually very popular uh literature during the middle ages yeah it's popular during the romantic period as well yeah yeah yeah, uh, and and yeah, it um, it makes sense, you know, like because uh, you don't have a a great uh, well organized empire like you did when the Romans were ruling things, 
and you know they they were gathering all sorts of taxes they had a much deeper revenue pool and a lot more recruits and resources so the armies were much more like a unit but then during the medieval times it, you nobody has those kind of resources like the romans did or the manpower but still you know it, weapons technology is advancing and of course i did a video on that on my own private channel like how um weapons progress and like offensive and defensive technology feeds off of each other. So you come up with uh, better weapons, then the other people have to come up with better defense. And then again, you have to come up with better weapons. And I think what really um, like chivalry is, and all that kind of ethical stuff is a way to get people to self enforce as opposed to having like the government enforce everything it's a cultural enforcement like a value system and then of course when the guns start proliferating and becoming more common then it kind of becomes the death of this stuff yeah then it goes back to the state yeah but they still would use cavalry charges for a long time you know even after guns although they're not going to be like the kind of cavalry that's heavily ar armored covered in in that stuff because with guns it's not worthwhile the gun will just go through that and it and it's more burden on the horse but they still would use them because you can't uh you know they don't have like um machine guns or anything like that you got to reload your gun so while maybe you fire a few shots and then the cavalry comes and kills everybody while they're reloading that kind of yeah. thing like yeah. uh the charge of the light brigade you know we discussed for the crimean war I, yeah. uh, one one thing I did want to mention, which you mentioned, uh, talked about weapons developing, like um, the knights couldn't have been possible, the lance fighting uh, without stirrups, because that without a stirrup, you cannot hold a lance while sitting on a horse. And uh, before that, people were, before the, before the stirrups were invented, they would only use uh, or mainly yeah. use swords. So, yeah. yeah. And then, and then, um, I mean, yeah, good point. Uh, very good. But like then after guns have proliferated more, they're back to cavalry charges with swords. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. And no armor. Or maybe just a breastplate, but then eventually no armor at all. Yeah, I guess speed was then more important. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. it's like no point because because uh, it, it's not going to do anything but weigh you down. And then, of course, armor comes back in response to shrapnel mainly. Do you know why it was the Knights of the Round Table? Why? So um, nobody would, uh, everybody was equal. Nobody would fight about how, who had the best seats. Oh, uh, yeah. I wonder how much of that was real. You know, when it comes to uh, the King Arthur stuff, there's a lot of, there's a lot of anachronistic interpretations of that. Like, um, especially during the 1800s, when they were when they were uh, doing all these stories and poems about them, they're showing them in like um, 15th century armor. And then the average person, like I think these days, the average young person isn't even being taught about this stuff in school or anymore. But back when I was in school, people thought Arthur was English. They're like, no, he wasn't. He was, uh, if anything, he'd be probably related to the Welsh people, assuming he existed at all. You know, and um, they were actually fighting against the English, trying to keep them from taking over. And if the kind of gear that they had wouldn't have been any kind of plate armor at all, or even like full body mail, like that's more around the time of the Crusades. These guys would have had salvaged Roman gear. And even the Romans, like uh, when they were uh, when they were still at the height of their power, they would still use older gear, so uh, you would you would see helmets from multiple eras among their troops, and that's the probably what uh, Arthur and his guys would have had would have been looking like you know uh, fifth century Roman stuff or auxiliary stuff like Roman auxiliaries. If they had anything at all, it would have been probably whatever was left behind by the auxilia units that were stationed there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that reminds me talking about the helmets. Uh, apparently, William Marshall at one point, because modesty was also one of those virtues, and mm -hmm. um, it, they wanted to give like the reward of the the most excellent 
um, night of the tournament and they wanted to to give it to one guy and he declined and then another guy this guy declined and then finally they were going to give it to him but they couldn't find him and it turns out uh, he was uh, having somebody trying to get the helmet off his head because he got pummeled so badly that uh, the helmet was stuck and he couldn't get oh. his helmet off anymore. <laughs> so some dude was trying to like de-dent his helmet so he could wow, get it off. Was, <laughs> yeah. Wow, and, still on his head. and because of that, that's why he was like forced to accept the, <laughs> the reward. So, yeah. Been like, Oh my goodness. But yeah, modesty was also one of those virtues. But yeah, they would like bludgeon each other. That's which is, you know, they weren't uh, they weren't definitely uh, cut from a different cloth than we yeah. today. But it's, I find it interesting also that on the one hand you have this like Renaissance fair version of uh midi like mid the Middle Ages where everything is like so beautiful and grandose or grandiose, and then you also have the version where everything was just dirty and people's teeth were rotting and people would just shit everywhere. And it's like, no, that's not what the middle ages were like either. You know, it's kind of, um, yeah, you, you had, you, you had culture and you had, you had like, yeah, doctors were not very good. Sanitation but, was not very good either. Like, no, but you know, but most, street. yeah, but most people like you didn't have big cities for the most part. There was so. still crap in the streets in the 1800s though, to be fair. Yeah, and people yeah. actually, but people actually had good teeth because they didn't eat any sugar. Oh, yeah. yeah. So think about that. And then they got in fights and they knocked each other's teeth out, anyways. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that was my story of uh, this week. Uh, hope you learned something. So, yeah, uh, I didn't actually know about this guy. I feel like I should have known about him. I'm kind of. Uh, He's if like I, the, I would be embarrassed if I had the capacity to be embarrassed, I guess. Yeah, he's like the 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 most famous sportsman of the day, I guess. The Ronaldo, or I don't know, what's uh, Wayne Brady or something? Is that isn't that a football player over there? Uh, I don't know. No, I really don't pay attention <laughs> to sports. I feel like they don't deserve my attention. Me neither. Especially so. now. But I think sports, yeah, you know, sports was probably introduced as a way to replace this real violence, like replacing well, no, real violence. Yeah, but that's also why they introduced the tournaments, because they they wanted people to, to be busy when there were no wars to fight. So Yeah. See, my view is I don't want to fight a war or, or care about sports. I just want to sit and uh, draw <laughs> and write and maybe play some video games, eat some tasty food, and otherwise be left alone. I don't, I don't have any aggression in me. Uh, I like sports uh, to do them. I just don't care to watch sports. That's I don't even care to do them. I'd rather just go and, and run and lift weights to get in shape and not be bothered with having to play on a team with other people. Like, I don't care. I, I mean, let me just uh, – I never enjoyed it. I don't even like uh, team endeavors and video games that much. Uh, yeah. I'd rather just be a lone wolf. That's why we're into history, probably. So. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Telling people about guys that are all like better and uh, stronger than anybody today. Yeah, people on my team have been dead for a couple centuries. So. <laughs> 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 yeah. All right. Well, um, hey, uh, if you're st <clears throat> still listening, thank you for uh, for tuning in. Uh, each week, we'll come with a new story. If you have any recommendations uh, we'd like you'd like us to do, please let us know in the comments. Uh, if you have a like, uh, we appreciate it. If you want to share it, uh, appreciate that even more. Uh, other than that, Ivor, I think we should close it off, right? Yep, close it off. If you like our uh, video, uh, yeah, leave us a comment and share. Those are probably our favorite things is when you give us some feedback even if it's nasty feedback and then also yeah. um you know if you like our videos do share it that will help us as well all right, all right. see you in the next one. Right.